From the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, this is the Bob Harrington Show. Dr. Robert Harrington is the Arthur L. Bloomfield Professor and Chair of Medicine at Stanford University. Hi, this is Bob Harrington from Stanford University here on the heart.org and Medscape Cardiology. Over the years that many of you have listened to this podcast, you probably have noticed that I enjoy talking to physician writers, people who are opining either around some large societal issue or on occasion our colleagues who are writing fiction. I have the honor and the pleasure of having my office right next door to one of the world's great physician authors, and that is Dr. Abraham Verghese. Abraham is the Lyndon Meyer and Joan Lane Provesio Professor at Stanford University and is the Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Medicine. Abraham has a lot of interest in some of those we've talked about on this podcast. He's very interested in the bedside examination. Most recently, he's been interested and has created a center at Stanford for an understanding of the patient-physician relationship. And he's also written quite eloquently about storytelling and the ritual of medicine. Abraham and I have an opportunity to talk on a frequent basis. And one of the things that we frequently talk about is not writing, but reading. And both the joy and sometimes the relief that reading, not medical journals and science, but rather fiction and literature and poetry, the joy that that can bring to one's professional and personal life. So I thought it'd be fun on this podcast to have a conversation with Abraham about reading and what it can add to our lives. So Abraham, thank you very much for joining us here on Medscape Cardiology. Thanks for having me, Bob. Uh, Always a pleasure. As I said in my intro, Abraham, you and I frequently run into each other in the hallway and talk about what we're reading Talk a little bit from your perspective, both as a writer and a reader, of what do you see the life benefits of reading that might be offered to a physician, a nurse, a PA, others involved in cardiovascular medicine? Well, I'm obviously biased towards uh, literature, but I actually think that it plays such an important role in our ability to imagine things. I mean, if you think about the extraordinary act of taking those little signals on a page that we call words and then translating them into a mental movie in your head, which is what we do uh, with a novel. I'm convinced that if we don't exercise that part of our brain sufficiently, then we actually have an atrophy of our imagination. Uh, Some of our ability to imagine in other spheres of life, I would imagine would suffer. But I think more than that, despite our fairly broad worlds, we still have a fairly narrow experience of what it is to be the other. It's hard to put oneself in someone else's shoes, but the beautiful thing about literature is that when it works well, it offers one that opportunity to live in someone else's world. And I think that's particularly germane to medicine. I think anybody who wants to read about end of life could begin by you know, reading a textbook about end of life and all the stages of grieving and not death and so on. But if you want to feel it viscerally, in my mind, there really is nothing like reading, for example, The Death of Ivan Illich by Tolstoy, which we love to teach because you have this wonderful, powerful character who's full of himself and full of power. And then he's brought to his knees by this disease. And one by one, his friends and his family seem to drop away. And he has a sense that He's just become an impediment to their progress and that they would be quite relieved if if the sickness finally took him. And the only person who demonstrates the sort of empathy that I think would be emblematic of what we in medicine would love to see in our physicians is his servant, Gerasim, who is just sort of very simply with him and keeps his legs warm and sits with him and helps him in his most embarrassing functions. I think it's just a wonderful way to viscerally get what it feels like and what our role is. That's one example that I'd start with as to why I think we need it. But I think more than that, we underestimate the power of fiction to change the world. I love to ask people, what do you think ended slavery in America? 
Was it a president? Was it a revolution? Was it a political scientist somewhere? No, it was a wonderful book that captured the public's imagination. It was Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it just brought to people's attention and understanding what it was to be slavery. And then the whole idea of slavery became unpalatable in this country. And similarly in Britain, one of my favorite novels, A.J. Cronin's The Citadel, you know, about a Welsh mining town and the health conditions there. That book so captured the British public imagination that it led to the birth of the National Health Service. So I think fiction has that power and to the degree that our postmodern in a very scientific era for all its wonderful attributes is so focused on the science and the facts and the quantitative nature of things. I think we do ourselves a disservice by not exercising that other side of our brain. It's mesmerizing to hear you describe your love of literature and the role that it can play in our lives. I was struck by the fact that you took three examples, one from American literature, one from British literature, and one from Russian literature. And each one of those societies has a long tradition of producing authors who are in many ways producing commentaries on current state of life. You started the conversation with some of the great Russian authors, and you've mentioned one, but there's a series who are in, in some ways have presented us both a wonderfully enthusiastic picture of the human condition, but in other cases, Russian literature can be quite dark and really exploring some of the more, if I can say it, depressing sides of the human condition. How do you tease that out, Abraham, where you're looking for literature to teach, to uplift, but you're also looking for it, as you say, to experience the other perspective? In medicine, we have had this notion that it's good for our medical students to embrace literature and it'll help round them out for the reasons that I just described. And at one point in my career, given that some of my books were being taught in these burgeoning literature and medicine or human medical humanities programs, I had the experience of actually taking on the task of starting a humanities program at the University of Texas in San Antonio at the Health Science Center. And I found it to be quite a challenge because we're feeding our medical students with this tremendous gush of knowledge in the first two years. And although they arrive with tremendous enthusiasm, they become very bottom line oriented. It's going to be on my test. <laughs> Otherwise, why do I want to read about right. Ivan Illich? And then ironically, when they reach their third and fourth years, when they most need it is when we have the least access to them in a sense, because they're scattered all over. I came back to the sense that the best way we teach, teach literature is really at the bedside in the context of the patients we're caring for. And very much the same way that you would cite a seminal paper, you trot out. I have my favorites that I trot out. You know, we're recording this, Bob, at a very poignant time in medicine. And I find myself reaching for Camus' The Plague, which is a book that I've loved and I've yeah, uh, you know, gone to wonderful book. And I've gone to it several times and the profound wisdom and it applies to our day and age, you know, it's just striking to pull out because I think the very nature of any outbreak, the handmaiden to any outbreak is that it comes with a metaphor. In SARS, it was the metaphor of the Chinese plague and then it became the Asian plague. And every outbreak has its particular metaphor. But if you read what, uh, what one of Camus' narrators says towards the end of the plague, uh, I think he says about the citizens of Oran, he says, they went on doing business, arranged for journeys and formed views. How should they have given a thought to anything like plague, which rules out any future, cancels journeys, silences the exchanges of views. They fancied themselves free and no one will ever be free so long as there are pestilences. And it's full of yeah, it's profound amazing. little nuggets like that, which are just echoing for me very differently right now, given our collective experience with COVID-19, which is really something we've never seen before, but it's not something we shouldn't have expected. Well, and it's interesting that you picked that particular passage to read, because I reflect on watching just the news last night and looking at the trouble that cities are having, conveying the message of social distancing, et cetera. And how is it that those of us who are in the profession are thinking of this constantly? Those of our 
of friends and neighbors who are outside the profession are maybe not thinking of it the same way. And uh, Camus noted that a long time ago, didn't he? He was so aware of that. But I think what's even more profound to me is we are, in a sense, under siege. Uh, you and I are working in offices that have skeletal staffing and the traffic has vanished in our town. And, you know, every sort of psychological nuance of what I'm feeling, whether it be fear or concern for my colleagues or worry about the future, he seems to have found a way to echo every single thing that I could possibly think about. And I think that's the power of good literature. Uh, I think of it as the great lie that tells the truth about how the world lives. And in a sense, that's the reason we go to literature as our touchstone, to find out that great truth of how we live. Abraham, you and I are of the age where we grew up reading extensively. I was an English literature major as an undergraduate, and I actually found when I went to medical school, my ability to consume large amounts of information was aided by the fact that I was very comfortable with reading constantly. I also have found since I was a child that the daily respite from the rest of life could be found in a book, and I continue that to this day. Do you think that the generations of today are reading like the generation that you and I are from? I don't think they are. I don't think I am either, to be honest. I find myself increasingly connected to the little screen in my left hand. I think we all are. It's insidious. So not only are we keeping up with our various updates and messages, but I think we're slowly being conditioned to absorb information in you know, bite-sized nuggets that then the luxury of taking on a big book has been forgotten. But I think it's, you know, it's a mistake to sort of bemoan that too much because I think with every generation, there will be a passing and a rediscovery of things. And I have a sense that the pendulum will swing back. I notice in myself that more and more I'm experiencing great literature in the form of audiobooks. Yes. And it's a completely different experience, one that I don't think I quite appreciated until the last couple of years. As a writer, you always, always try to read your sentences out to see how they sound and make sure that, you know, that the rhythm isn't being thrown off by some jarring little juxtaposition that you've made there. But I don't think I've quite appreciated how profound it could be to listen to the whole thing. So it's made me even more conscious of how I listen. I think a lot of people spend a lot of time listening to podcasts and so on, which I think is wonderful, this, this being a case in point. But I also think that it doesn't take much. It takes this kind of encouragement from us to point people to literature that could be as profoundly meaningful to them as the podcast on the latest, latest something. I'm smiling as you speak because one of both the great joys and the great disappointments in my own reading is that when somebody would make a movie of a book that I had been particularly fond of, and there was that moment of great joy when the character sounded and looked like you had perhaps envisioned from your reading, and then there were those moments of disappointment when you would say, oh, this character, they're nothing <laughs> like You've had that experience. For me, one of the great books of my childhood was the Tolkien series, which I read numerous times over the years through middle school and high school and college and young adulthood. And when they finally made the movies that we had all been thinking about for years, I was overjoyed with how much they had captured the vision and the voices and the persona of characters that I knew really well. That tends to be almost exceptional that the movie doesn't in some way disappoint you. I remember hearing this from one of my teachers at the Iowa Writers Workshop. He talked about how there were these two arcs of a story and one part of the arc was the writer providing the words. And then the other equally important part was the reader providing their imagination. And in this collaborative way, in middle space, you created this fictional dream. It really wasn't yours. It was a collaborative effort with the reader. And if you provided too many words, too much explanation, and robbed them of their ability to imagine, then you'd done them a disservice. And if you provided too few words, like, for example, Finnegan's Wake, uh, God knows what the hell that book is about. I don't know what it's about. <laughs> but if you have too few words, then you also disappoint them. But the great beauty of a work of art like Dickens' Bleak House is that 
it doesn't exist on the page. It exists in this collaborative moment between writer and reader. And so I think it's not unusual to then go to a movie and find that a particular director's vision and their fictional dream of this book cannot possibly be exactly like yours. And I think you're destined for that sort of disappointment. And I must say, I watch more movies more easily than I ever have watched before because of the accessibility. This is not in any way to detract from that, but there's a certain degree of passivity in watching a movie. In some ways, it's all being delivered to you, the epiphany and all that. There are still nuances required of you. I think the more challenging filmmakers, Kurosawa and Fellini, will really challenge you in a way that I think a writer does. But for the most part, you are able to tune out and just sit there and be manipulated, which is its own satisfaction. But I like to remind my medical students that there was a reason that William Osler at his bedside had a stack of books and they had nothing to do with medicine. They were great reads. Uh, Parenthetically, I should say, I I tried to make my way through Osler's list of books because it's been published of what he had at his bedside. And frankly, they're just beyond me. They're beyond this era. They're not relevant as much as they could be to our time and place. But I think the principle applies. I look around and I see all the great physicians I admire, you being a case in point, have a side to them that is about reading, is about exercising their right brain. As our young physicians come to know that, I'm hoping that it will inspire them. And of course, many of them are wonderful readers. I know that from their book clubs and whatnot. But there are many more, uh, including my colleagues, distinguished colleagues, who will say to me, uh, Abraham, I'm a nonfiction sort of guy. I only read serious stuff. And, you know, I say, really serious? <laughs> and I tell them about Uncle Tom's Cabin and the Citadel because I think they're missing something. I could not agree more. And I, I, at my own bedside table, I have a stack of books that I am working my way through. And they're a combination of fiction and nonfiction. And as you know, I take great joy in reading fiction and I read it every day. I have my own ritual of end of the day is how I unwind is with a minimum of 15, 20 minutes, a maximum of probably 45 minutes to an hour of trying to read. And I do think it helps me process my day and escape for a little bit and just really think about the other things that are important in life other than the day-to-day job. So with that, Abraham, I want to take the prerogative of asking you, what are you reading today? I mean, you mentioned the play, (laughs) but what are you reading? I don't write much poetry. I think I have one published poem to my credit, but I love reading poetry because somebody defined poetry as that moment when your heart and your mind are saying the same thing. The abstractness of poetry, the soaring nature of its imagination, I think is very stimulating to me as a writer. So often, both before I go to bed and when I wake up, start to write, when I'm about to enter my writing sort of moment, I will often read a poem to just remind myself how possible it is to transcend all the barriers that limit us in our day. For example, in our day, we're limited by the fact that I can't jump into your head and know what you're thinking. I can't cross over to death and report back. But by the vehicle of poetry and literature, for that matter, you transcend all these barriers. And very much like literature, I think it provides you instructions. Uh, There's a poem I was reading last night by John Stone. I've scribbled it down in my little notebook, which I carry around. John Stone was a friend of mine. You probably know him. He's a cardiologist at Emory and started their emergency medicine program. And he passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a well-known poet. And this one was just the one that I happened to write down It's called Talking to the Family. Uh, May I recite it for you? Uh, Absolutely. I think that I will certainly enjoy it. I suspect our listeners will enjoy it as well. It's from his book called The Smell of Matches, which has been living by my bedside for the last couple of months. Things don't seem to move away from there very quickly. (laughs) And uh, this, this particular poem is called Talking to the Family. And it goes like this. My white coat waits in the corner like a father. I will wear it to meet the sister in her white shoes and organza dress. In the live of winter, the milkless husband holding the baby, I will tell them. They will put it together and take it apart. Their voices will buzz. The cut ends of their nerves will curl. I will take off the coat, drive home, and replace the light bulb in the hall. Wow. That's it. 
you know. Wow. And I think it just conveys the, the extreme roles that we have, the exactly. ordinariness of our lives, but the profound moments that we have the privilege to witness and sometimes don't have words for. I mean, he doesn't really say what we're to make of this, except to say, I feel this, I, I hope you can identify with it. It's taking the nobility of what we do and the privilege of what we do and juxtaposing it with the ordinariness of all of our lives that we're trying to balance. I think it's a wonderful way of thinking about that balance that we're all trying to achieve. And I think it's a very profound poem to read for what we're all going through today, that we're all spending our days struggling with this epidemic, struggling with getting ready to try to quell a surge in patient cases. And at the same time, we're all going home at the end of the day to change the light bulb and to make dinner. It is a juxtaposition that sometimes literature and poetry can do far greater justice to than just us talking. Do you read much poetry? As you know, because you and I, uh, for several years, had had a ritual of having dinner together with our partners and reading poetry and trying yeah. to bring a favorite poem. And, and you know what one of Rana and I's favorite poem is, is the E.E. E. Cummings poem, I Carry Your Heart. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you've Indeed. talked about that, so that's a very special one. Well, I want to be cognizant of our listeners' time, Abraham, so I'm going to take, again, editor's prerogative. Many of us are big fans of you as an author, including Cutting for Stone. And we've been waiting a few years for your latest production. What can your readers out there expect? Well, Bob, from being in the office next door to me, it's been quite a saga with this book. I mean, for one thing, I think I, I love long books myself. I love the experience of entering a world and passing through the centuries and then finally put down the book and it's Tuesday. I love that feeling of being transported. And so I think unbeknownst to me, it seems I have the bug to write a long novel. And so I've just delivered my novel to my publishers and they're extraordinarily excited by it. It is really long. And I think we all feel that you know, I could do well to trim it. So I'm engaged in that process. And it's not as hard as one would think. There's something very interesting about putting a, something aside for a few weeks and coming back to it. And immediately you see some of the redundancies. So the title of the book uh, is The Covenant of Water, and it's very much a saga that has a strong element of medicine. It begins in 1900 in the south of India, where my parents are from, although I didn't grow up there myself. I grew up in Africa, and it covers three generations of a family in which one or more members of each generation drowns. So there's a condition of familial drowning, and the conceit of the book revolves around that. But no, really, I think, what is medicine but life plus plus? So the, the book is really about love. It's about family. It's about joys and sorrows. It's, uh, it's just about a life lived. Abraham, thank you for sharing that. As many of us are anxiously waiting to get our hands on the book so that we can read it and share those stories with you. So thank you for sharing that with us today. Well, I want to thank you, Abraham Verghese, for joining us here on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. Professor Verghese is the Vice Chair of Education in the Department of Medicine here at Stanford and is the Meyer and Lane Proversteel Professor here at Stanford University. Abraham, this has been a real delight for having you join me to talk about reading and literature. Keep it up, and thank you for your time. Thank you. The pleasure was mine. Thank you, Bob.